This episode of the show is brought to you from the Salesman.org HubSpot Studios. Coming up on today's episode of the Salesman Podcast. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that so much of what we do in management, in sales, uh, in life, is making things more complicated than they need to be. What do we really think is essential now and why do we believe that? What's the very best way to achieve the objective that we're trying to? Uh, instead of just, let's just try and do everything. The, the, the people that are unbelievable in sales aren't the people doing that. Hello, Sales Nation. My name is Will Barrett. I'm the host of the Salesman Podcast, the world's most downloaded B2B sales show. On today's episode, we have an absolute legend. We have Greg McCown. He is the author of the million copy bestseller, Essentialism. Highly recommended for me. A great book. And he's also the author of the new book, which is out right now, Effortless. And on today's show, Greg is helping me answer the question, well, does B2B sales really need to be as, as difficult, as painful, and as brutal as what it seemingly is. Everything that we talk about, including Greg's podcast, books, and everything else is available in the show notes over at salesman.org. And so with that said, let's jump right into it. Greg, welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Well, it's great to be with you. I'm glad to have you on, mate. Okay, so we're going to dive into the new book. We're going to spin that into context of B2B sales. And hopefully we can start to answer this question, a question that we talk about all the time on the show of, does B2B sales need to be as hard and as seemingly complicated as as what everyone tries to make it out to be? And let me frame it up from your perspective. Let me give you as open-ended question as I can to get things started. Does the path to sales success, business success, life success, does it have to be as complicated as what we all make it out to be? Or is there, is there a different way? Is there a, perhaps a simpler path? Well, yeah. I mean, I think that so much of what we do in management, in sales, uh, in life, is making things more complicated than they need to be. Uh, and, and one of the ways, actually, is a conversation I had with um, his real name, Mike Evangelist, uh, working in, um, he, he created the first DVD machines wow. or was in the early stages of those. And so when they first came out, I mean, these were massive machines of $60,000 per machine. I mean, they're just cost prohibitive for anyone outside of the industry. And they were trying to make them more affordable, 25, 35,000 and so on. They had a 1000 page manual to go with it, if you can imagine. And then they got purchased by Apple. And the goal there was to try and make the product even simpler, the software that they created even simpler. And so they worked like the next two weeks preparing to meet with Steve Jobs to try and make this simpler still. And when Steve walks into the room, they're, they're quite proud of what they've done because they're, they've made it so much simpler than what they had before. But this is where he walks in, and this is the part of the story, that if people know the story, they know this bit, which is he walks in and he said, listen, this is what the app's going to look like. There's going to be one button. It's going to say burn. You drag your thing over there, and that's the app we're going to build. And in that moment, Mike, first of all, just felt embarrassed because mm -hmm. of how simple that was compared to what he had. But he also discovered a lesson that has lived with him and I think is worth repeating, which is that he, he realized he was trying to go from complicated to simple, from his 1,000-page manual to something more digestible. Whereas in what Steve was doing, even with all his experience, was to start with zero and say, what do you have to have in order to achieve your purpose? And I think that's a very portable story, and it applies to B2B sales, where you say, what do you have to have? Start with zero. What do you have to have in order to make a sale to be effective in what you're doing? And that's better than just trying to take all the clutter of everything you've ever heard and all the sometimes the nonsense and so on that you've been poured into your mind and then try to simplify it. To me, that's a one way to think about the question you've asked. I, I love this. So uh, a similar anecdote. So one of the things that Amazon tracks, very few things that Amazon tracks, is the number of tickets per order. So they don't want you to speak to anyone. They don't want any questions. They don't want you to spend time going through multiple pages. They want you to find the right product at the right price at the right time, get delivered the next day, same day here in the UK, uh, kind of as I'm, as I'm waiting for delivery to come at some point this evening, uh, pre 10 p.m. 
and they they track number of tickets, number of questions on that. So they want to create such a seamless solution that there is no sales or the sales is done at scale via a website and content. Um, so I guess it's a similar kind of way of looking at things perhaps paradoxically or inverting what we think is normal uh, and to, to refine a better solution for everyone involved. So with that then, Greg, well, right, cause it's one thing for us to sh share these anecdotes, right? It's another thing to start to implement this and to change mindsets on it, right? Why are we wired to want complexity? Because it seems like every product gets more complex over time, other than maybe Apple products that get redefined. And they're cl clearly very good at UX design and uh, user interface design. Why is it that we can't overcomplicate things? Why is it that things that seemingly could be simple, we humans tend to overcomplicate and, and make unsimple? Well, I mean, I think that there's only really two things that simplify. Um, one is failure when a system no longer works, and so you have now no choice but to change it. And the second is to be what I call, it doesn't have to be this name, but what I call an essentialist, which is someone who simplifies before you have to. And, you know, that's what Steve Jobs is. That's what uh, you know, that's what Amazon was doing when they came up with, to use another anecdote, the the one clip system. I mean, that that shows exactly the point is that he didn't wait till they weren't making sales to go, well, my, maybe our system is too hard. Maybe there's too complex that he says, look, I want to remove everything at the time. This was the time of the Internet when um, so this is Bezos, of course, and, and, and at the time, if you wanted to buy something online, every page was a different, you know, you had to okay, put in your name, uh, click, uh, put in your first yeah. address, click, 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 click. You've got so many steps and you're doing it every single time you want to buy, buy something. So it's this very convoluted process, but it was completely accepted and normalized. I spoke to the, the lead engineer on that project too. And for weeks, months even, he had been trying to simplify and streamline that the existing process. But again, if you come at it from a perspective of an essentialist, you say, you say, well, well, how do we have, how do we have no steps? It doesn't matter how simple you make a step. What if you don't have a step? You know, that's always a better option. So you're trying to, uh, to use the agile manifesto term, you're trying to maximize the steps not taken. And so that's a, that is a very particular frame. The traditional frame is that you start simple. And you gain a, you come up with a problem, and then the problem, uh, you 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 get together, you brainstorm either on your own or with other people. What's the solution? And you find a solution, and you add that. Now you've added something, and you feel good about it until you keep doing this process of add, new problem, solve it, add complexity, new problem, solve it, add complexity, and and without really ever meaning to, you've just continued to add complexity and add complexity to the point of failure. In fact, now this is deeper than maybe you want to go or whatever, but, but there's actually a really amazing book about, um, about the, the, um, the fall of complex societies. <laughs> and, uh, and, and basically what he says is that these massive societies that cease to exist, the, you know, uh, the Roman Empire, the, the Greek Empire, and some others that have collapsed even further than that, so we don't really even talk about them anymore, that they all have in common, pre to, pre to this analysis, uh, it, people thought, well, every collapse of complexity is just to do with well, one was a famine and one was an external you know, war and one was civil war and one was whatever. That, that was why. But actually what this historian has identified is that it's all the same problem is that your complexity gets to the point that you use up all of the resources that you, uh, that you have at your disposal to maintain the complexity. And at that point, your system becomes very fragile because it can't deal with the next big issue that comes along you've got no more resources to add more complexity so so i think it's very well intended but it grows out of a certain perspective that says we we need to solve problems by adding complexity there's other leaders who come out with a different perspective that really say no what we need to do is constantly be starting from zero and making this as close to effortless as possible and that that's excuse me and and that is what i would be you know advancing for people in B2B sales. This translates probably more surprisingly accurately to B2B sales than what you might imagine at first glance, Greg, because 
this isn't always the case, but 99 times out of 100, salespeople become sales managers, become sales leaders. I don't know of any sales leaders or even CROs, people at that level, um, whether it's in the enterprise, whether it's small, medium enterprise, that haven't had at least some sales within their career, right? Now, what happened 20, 30 years ago is you'd cold call people because individual you're trying to sell to had an office desk. They were sat in the office. They, the phone rang. They picked it up. Then it moved on to cold email. So people would get so few emails every day that you'd reply to them all. You'd open them all and they become, it was just such an effective channel. Now people are using social selling, social media. Uh, people are using a blended approach. Uh, salespeople are leveraging adverts to the target individuals and get inbound leads. Um, HubSpot, our partner for this show, uh, just that the masters of generating inbound uh, leads and then having salespeople follow up with context on the content that's being consumed and all this kind of stuff. But what happened is, I th this has happened to like for every company I've ever consulted with ever, this has happened. The sales managers are now, uh, they were the individuals who succeeded with cold email. So they're in middle management, pitching more emails, more often, less customization, just spam the marketplace. The individuals above them were brought up and had success on um, cold calling. So then more dials, more dials, more dials. And the individuals at the bottom of the, um, the, 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 the hierarchy are willing to experiment and, and, and see what works and perhaps start from scratch and, and, and remove some of this legacy burden that they have. But of course, they're all targeted. They're all incentivized. The whole system is built upon um, falsehoods that were once correct and now are incorrect. So the, the whole thing's just a mess, Greg. So with that said, other than having yourself come in, other than having Steve Jobs reincarnated and, and come in and change the sales process right, how do we, from the perspective of a salesperson from the bottom of the hierarchy, how do we perhaps sell this idea of essentialism and sell this idea of starting from zero and re, kind of re-sussing out what is fundamentally true and false? How do we sell that up the food chain and how do we start to implement some of this ourselves? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a few things that you can do. Um, I think the first is to is to recognize that you have a role to play in in that conversation. Uh, so I'm not advocating an essentialism that you should suddenly say no to everyone and everything without thinking <laughs> sure. about it. That feels, you know, you know, that would be a book called Noism. Uh, I didn't write that book. You know, it's about what's essential. But I also don't think you have to simply say give only a polite yes, as if there's only those two options, polite yes or a rude no. You know, I think that everyone has the obligation to be able to be an essentialist in their place and to ask the question, well, what what do we really think is essential now? And why do we believe that? And what's the very best way to achieve the objective that we're trying to? Uh, instead of just, let's just try and do everything that we that we could do in every generation of B2B sales. Uh, you know that that strategy to me doesn't seem like a thoughtful one. It's a it's, a, it's an undisciplined pursuit of more versus the disciplined pursuit of less but better. And so wherever you are, I think it's to is to start having that conversation. Well, what what if, if we could only do one thing? If we could only pursue one strategy, what would it be now? And why do we think that now? And what's the latest to support that? And to be able to have a conversation around those things in your sphere of influence, I think can be quite powerful. Um, there's a good metaphor for this that I like, which is, um, you know, on the on these massive uh, ships, uh, the, the, the rudder of the ship, you can imagine this is the big sales enterprise, the, the great huge ship and the, and the rudder on the back, these rudders themselves are so massive, they need a smaller rudder to move that larger rudder that moves the ship. And that smallest rudder is called the trim tab. I think that's quite good analogy for uh, for the individual salesperson or wherever you are within the sales, you know, the great ship of sales to say, my job is to is to not just do everything everyone else is doing, to not do everything that every competitor is doing, but instead to, to try to seek out in collaborative ways, yeah, but what really is essential for us right now? What's important now? And that's the way you win. I think that's a nice metaphor, a nice you know phrase to W-I-N, what's important now. You win by figuring out what's important now, not what was important 10 years ago or 20 years ago or what everybody else is doing and, and advocate and discuss and collaborate around that question. Yeah, I love this idea of do less 
better. And a layer of B2B context on top of that is that not all sales leads are as valuable as as each other, right? If you cold call someone, they say, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll speak with you next week at this date. So I'll see how I feel. Um, <laughs> that's, that's worth you know X. And someone who reads content on your website, sees you as a thought leader in your space, reaches out to you personally because they appreciate the content that perhaps you're producing or that you're featured in the organization that you represent is producing. That lead has clearly got uh, social proof behind it. There's a level of rapport. There's a level of trust already built. So that lead is going to be worth more. So is it fair to say then that if we if we do dumb sales down the best that we can into lead generation and then closing of leads, we make the whole process easier, more seamless if we focus on getting more uh, less better leads as opposed to focusing on more of just stuff. Yeah, hundred percent. And and what I found is that um, is that you're you're busy but not productive. Um, people in sales, the people that are stretched too thin all the time, um, that, that, that group, it's like they imagine sales to be, I don't know, like mining coal or something where their job is just to make as many touch points as possible, as many people as possible. And it's just get as much coal from point A to point B. The, the, the people that are unbelievable in sales aren't the people doing that. They're the ones that, like on day three of the quarter, they're they're dumb. They've hit the numbers for the quarter. They're just it's unbelievable. They're not doing the the all nighters. They're not doing the, the, the burning themselves out. They're you know maybe they're doing six hour work day or, or sometimes even less. They just because they have the perspective. It's like a diamond mine, and so their job isn't to get as much possible stuff. It's what are the right ones? What are the right leads? And how do I nurture those leads? How do I get those diamonds out and polished? and cut because they're so extremely valuable. I think that contrast is a big difference between a non-essentialist salesperson and and an essentialist salesperson. So massively leading question here, Greg, but what What's your opinion on this idea of uh, people call different things, but like hustle culture? So you see, you uh, whole uh, Instagram. Pro- I think we're probably going to be on the same track as this, but you see whole Instagram profiles, massive audiences of of hustle this, hustle that, working crazy hours, and 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 people have blown up an audience and get a ton of attention by just by just doing more just crap every day and and glorifying the, the fact that they are perhaps spending time with doing what they want, family, friends, whatever it is, that we, uh, what I'm getting at is, I'm, I'm trying to, right, I'm trying to ask you a, a leader question because that's what I want to talk about. I'm trying not to put words in your mouth, but I think I know where you're going to go. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are your thoughts on that kind of culture, Greg? And is that healthy long-term for salespeople who have aspirations to do really well in their careers? Yeah, I mean, look, if if you if you want, like, there is an alternative to essentialism. I, I call it non-essentialism. This is for driven, capable people who want to say yes to everything all the time. They want to be hustling twenty four seven. And if that's working for people, what I generally say is like, well, keep doing it. <laughs> uh, just ignore what I'm saying. In fact, double down on it. Don't sleep at all. <laughs> you know, like, just go all the way in. If the strategy is so effective. But what I find is that generally speaking, and by generally, I mean like pretty close to always, it doesn't produce what it says on the packaging. Uh, it, it is it, We have been sold ourselves a bill of goods. And what we end up getting is burned out ourselves. We strain our most important relationships, both professionally and personally. And we just lose our sense of discernment about what what projects to pursue what strategy to pursue in our in our career and our life and so you just get to the point where where really none of it's working but the nature of hustle is that you can keep on going and keep doubling down on more and more hustle working even harder and harder even as it's not producing the results you want and so it can be quite a cycle uh yeah that's one path uh uh, you know, I think non-essentialism is based on a lie. If you try to do it all, you won't get it all. Uh, so that's that's in, you know that's inconvenient, but that is that is the vast majority the, the the research and also the anecdotal research and also my personal experience just working with companies all over the world is that that this is simply not workable. It isn't sustainable. 
Uh, in fact, I just literally this morning was reading some, some interesting new research that showed that, that leaders could not tell the difference. It, this was a, an actual study within an organization deliberately. To, 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 they couldn't tell the difference between someone who was working 80 hours a week and someone who said they were working 80 hours a week. This was part of an actual study to try and assess this. So this is just a, this is just like this false dominant assumption that 80 hours a week will produce double the results. Well, it just doesn't. <laughs> and so, you know, once people start to discover that, either because they choose to get ahead of the curve, be an essentialist before you have to, or whether you wait until everything starts to discombobulate and you start to find, my goodness, my personal life is a mess. My relationships are a mess. My numbers at work are a mess. You know, whichever whichever point you get to, you are going to find one day that you need to find an alternative path, a way out, and and the way out is the way of the essentialist. I love this. There's, there's an epidemic in the sales industry of as um, outreach becomes less effective, cold calling clearly is less and less. I, I, the audience know this, Greg, but you might enjoy it. I have. I think cold calling is this ineffective and that was such a waste of time that I, and no one's managed to do it yet. I've got an open bounty. If someone cold calls by mobile phone and pitches me something, I'll give them a thousand dollars. I would literally, just, I'll send them it, you know, cash it to them uh, immediately. And no one's managed to do this in six years of the podcast. So that's how dead I think cold calling is. Now, the, the epidemic though is that as something becomes less and less effective, it doesn't just tend to drop off a cliff. So it becomes less and less effective over the course of 10 years. And as uh, senior management is, is pitching that cold calling works and they're trying to pass that message down throughout the sales teams, it doesn't become, uh, let's find a more effective way of doing business. It becomes, how can we do more of this faster, more spam-like, which makes it even less effective and we get in this vicious cycle. So that's why I really wanted to have you on to talk about this. Um, are you familiar with the book, The One Thing? Yeah, yeah. I just I just had one of the co-authors of that on my podcast, the What's Central podcast, and uh, yeah, we had terrific support. Did you have Jay on? Go ahead. Yeah. So we, we've interviewed Jay a bunch of times, and uh, also Jeff, who is the uh, I think is now the president of the One Thing. We've had him on the show. So I I love the the way that they frame it up. I feel like it's quite similar to your um your kind of methodology and thoughts on this. Of um, you might be, I, I'm probably going to butcher it now as I say it, Greg. And um, but they they pitch you of. Uh, to ask this question of what's the one thing that you could do that would make everything else uh, obsolete? Is that how we sh is that a good starting point if we are looking to change our sales process? Should is that a, a good way to frame it up practically? Of what is the one thing that we could do that would make all of the other stuff that we're doing obsolete or, or, or less useful? Yeah, I definitely think so. I mean, the the word priority came into the English language in the 1400s, and it was singular. You know what what is the you know the very first or prior thing. And it stayed singular until the Industrial Revolution where people started speaking of priorities. And I struggle sometimes to really know what the, the, the useful definition of that word is. How can you have, or can you have very, very many, very first before all other things things? Uh, and yet, we, surely all of us have been to some sales meeting where somebody said with no sense of irony at all, you know, here are my 34 priorities. <laughs> you know, and, and when do they all have to be done? You know, yesterday. And, and so, you know, I... I just think that the idea of what is the most important thing to do, what is the first thing, what is the one thing that you can do that will have the, the, the most lasting impact in today's environment. And because it's such a noisy environment, you, you have to sometimes create a bit of space to be able to even ask that question uh, and, and, and to get clear on it. Uh, and, and even within sales where the, the, your objective is clear, most people have some sort of number that they've either been assigned or they choose or some stretch goal or whatever. So that that part can be quite clear compared to other areas of the business. But how you're going to do it, to have a single strategy, to know what your most important strategy is in this environment is an area I think a lot of sales people, especially B2B sales, uh, struggle with because there's so many there's so many possible ways to go about it now. For sure. So let's let's make the show slightly more holistic here. Do we need to do what we're talking about here in B two B sales in uh, other areas of our life? And if we do, is there a way to segment our life into a finite number of areas to practice all of this in? Because if we split our life into a hundred areas, then clearly we're just we're going to have a hundred goals, and so we're back in back at square one. Yeah, I mean something something that I really have thought a lot about 
and this is since writing essentialism is is like these um three concentric circles that that the in, inner circle is protecting the asset that's you know you as the salesperson the, you as the individual the second is your most important relationship so that's the second circle uh and and i particularly mean well i suppose it's both but it's it's your it's your personal relationships the ones that are going to matter you know throughout your life for, sure. forever um but also your most important clients the, the, those people that you know uh, the people you need to take care of and, and nurture uh and then the third is just the other important projects out there and here's what i have found it's the simplest idea in the world is that non-essentialists just start from the outside in uh they're trying to drink the ocean first <laughs> Every possible thing they could do out there, all the different latest things, all the shiny objects, all the uh, the latest tactics, all the meetings, all the emails, all the training, all the we webinars, I mean, just all of that noise, all that stuff. And so then when they get to their most important relationships, there's actually not much left for them. Uh, you know, get to the end of the day and, and, you know, in COVID times, it can be sometimes even worse. It just... You, you, you just go on, it's five o'clock, it's six o'clock, it's seven o'clock, it's eight. There's no natural end. By the time you see the people that matter most to you, you're actually not showing up very well, which doesn't help matters. And they're strained, those relationships get strained. Well, then at the end of the day, it's midnight. And instead of going to sleep, you don't feel very satisfied. You, you feel fatigued. Somebody said to me recently, oh, yeah, well, I'm just, I'm just uh, you know, scrolling through Zillow for two hours, you know, just, just to, trying to protect their asset, but actually they're just sleeping less. So that's the, the negative cycle. The essentialist starts from the inside out. That's the switch. You start by protecting your asset to make sure that you are physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually in a good, strong position so that then when you show up to the most important relationships, you're able to, uh, to show up well to them. You're able to listen to them and understand what they actually need. You're not misjudging what someone's saying and, and missing the, the cues of what they need and how you can then personalize what, you know, what your offering is to them. And so, so it just works so much better if you get the sequence right. To me, that's one way to divide up life that feels useful. That makes total sense. And when you mention uh, projects, uh, clearly we can have work projects, personal projects. Is there any data or, or research on whether we should have projects out of work? So, and this is from the context of a B2B salesperson. Hopefully the audience love the job. They love the product they sell. I used to love going to hospital operating rooms here in the UK. And my partner is a doctor. So I'd see her all the time in the hospitals. My mum was a, uh, uh, worked as a, a technician and uh, my brother is a pharmacist. So I'm surrounded by people within the NHS. So I used to love going in there. I'm really proud of the UK's NHS. I used to love going in there, hanging out with surgeons, selling the products, and it was an easy sale. They loved the, the, the service that we offered and it was, it was dead simple. I used to love it, right? So that would be a, I find that project, I used to find it really fulfilling. I really used to enjoy it. So, but for people who listen to this who perhaps aren't in such a, a great position and they've got a job, right, as opposed to, uh, is the research or, or data that shows that additional projects or projects outside of that, anything, uh, whether it's charity work, whether it's building a business, whatever it is, is there any data that shows that that, can, that, that is valuable? Is, what I'm asking is, can a, a slight bit more complexity add more value to uh, the overall picture? Well, I think that uh, one of my favorite examples of this is is um, um, the, the, the person who first coined the term uh, FOMO, uh, fear of missing out, as uh, is, um, uh, McGuinness, Patrick McGuinness, and I had him also on the podcast recently. And uh, it, it and one of the things that he learned was what he called the 10% entrepreneur. Uh, and so he's saying, look, if you're doing your main thing, your main thing either isn't 100% satisfying or you'd like to make a shift or you'd just like to explore with something else, don't try 100 things. Try one thing, but give it 10% of your energy and time. So, so you're, you're saying that that extra amount of space that, that I might use up just doing maybe sometimes just more more work in my existing job or just wasting it, you just create that 10% so that you can try out an experiment in this new area. Uh, and I think that's a nice, I mean, he, he goes into more depth about it, but but that's quite a nice way to to deal with FOMO. So fear, fear of missing out, 
course, is generally seen as a negative thing, and I think he thinks that too. But he also sees that it can you can do a test the next time that you feel the fear of missing out. You can say, "Am I just being jealous in just a sort of quite um, um, unimaginative way, or is this indicating to me that there's something I ought to be doing? You know, is it tapping something that's a genuine desire in me that I'm going, "Wow, I, that is that speaks to me." It's naming something in me. And and so you can sometimes use FOMA to your advantage in this way. And that's what he's advocating. When you do, you then try and say, okay, let's take a 10% portion of my life and let's test this. Let's actually go after this, but not in a way that's a complete, I've got to quit my job and pursue this 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 area. And then you just put yourself in such a stressful position. Uh, you know. And so I think that's one clever way to be able to also keep your primary work, your first job, in uh, in balance, uh, so that it doesn't just consume every waking hour, every thought, and consume your body and soul. So I do this, and I encourage the audience to, uh, similar to how you're describing there, of if you you want to, if you can, you want to pick something that's synergistic to your career, right? So if you're a B two B sales, perhaps it's building thought leadership, perhaps it's uh, getting involved in industry events, if you've got an interest in that, whatever it is that then adds to the bottom line over time. So some of the audience will know this because I there's loads of uh, entrepreneurs and 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 freelancers and people like that who listen to the show who want to learn how to sell as well. Clearly, it's it's valuable tool for them uh, as opposed to just B two B salespeople that we create and cater the content for. So some of these individuals I've had chats with, and I do a lot of the web design and uh, UX design on our on our training product and things like that. And it's a total waste of time and energy from our perspective. My my time is best spent doing these conversations, doing these interviews. That's what the sponsorships come in for or doing the training content. That's what people are paying for um, when, when people partner with us on, on that side of things. But I will carve out probably two or three hours a week, if, if not more, and a bit of time on the weekend um, of... I, I, I don't know a way, a way to phrase it, but basically un, time where I'm not prepared to feel guilty, where it's pretty much wasted, where I could pay one of our team um, you know, a salary to do the graphics work. And I just love doing it. I love messing around and literally getting the fonts perfect and, and, and all that kind of things. And I get tons of enjoyment out of it. And of course, it's synergistic somewhat to the, the content that we're producing. So that's how I kind of spin that. Because if I wasn't doing this, I probably would be in some kind of more uh, graphic design, uh, 3D design, 3D rendering kind of role. So that's how I tie things up. But I, I want to speak to that because because that's that's I think that's even something slightly different. It's not just hey, I just enjoy it, so I'm doing it. I think sometimes when we feel that pull, what we're discovering is uh, is is important uh, distinctive talent you know, or almost, you know, gifts that just maybe, yeah, maybe we didn't unwrap them fully or maybe we don't appreciate them as something because sometimes they're so deeply within us. Um, I mean, for me, for me personally, I can relate to it because graphics to me are as important, sometimes even more important than the ideas themselves for me. I I, I think I, I, you know, the, the presentation of ideas and the graphical representation of them are, are hugely valuable and really not always appreciated by people. They don't know that that matters so much, but they still feel it when they see it, when they hear it, uh, when they experience it. And and it, it leads with, you know, this is this is another Steve Jobs example, right? But when he, he used to every day, despite all those other things he could be doing, all the more valuable things he'd be doing, having lunch with uh, with Johnny Ive uh, and actually just talking possible products and, and, and discussing it. It was that was that the most important thing he could do for the bottom line for a company that was on the edge of bankruptcy? Well, you could some from a certain perspective, you would say that was not the essential thing. Sure, uh, you've just got to you've just got to sell what you have right now, I and mean, it's a it's a personal B two B analogy. And he's going, no, that isn't the priority. The priority is to create products that we love, that we're proud of, that are, that, that that create the future. And so I'm going to invest there. And I think that's. You know, leads me to a question. Actually, it's a question for you. Okay, okay. you ready for this? Sure. Turn the tables. I don't know <laughs> if anyone does this normally, but this is this is. And you weren't prepared. We we have no idea whether this is a good idea or not. So, so what is something for you right now in your life that is essential that you're under investing in? First answer. First thought. I'd, already I'd, I'd still I'd still say what we're saying that the graphics, the 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 that side of the business, we really stand out in the marketplace. Our content, not because. For example, we've just done this massive deal with HubSpot, right? They've sponsored the show for multiple years. It's the biggest um, sales 
training podcast partnership that like any has been done in the industry. It's really, I'm really happy with it. It's really awesome. And as you watch this back, Greg, and the audience sees this, there's going to be HubSpot thrown all over the, the content. So uh, so they'll, they'll, they'll have subtly been um, showing this already. Um, but one of the reasons why brands like HubSpot and, and all the other brands that we deal with, like Peloton, all these really cool brands want to work with us is because of the, the characters. We have an illustrator who does the characters. The, the comic content that we put out, the, the polish on things, the cameras that we use. This studio is hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of stuff that I didn't need to spend. We could have just done this on a webcam, but I really enjoy doing it. So I don't know if I'm answering your question here. So you can feel free to um, kind of pull me back and re-ask the question. But something that I, I feel is essential to me and I really enjoy doing is all the production stuff. And I could I could outsource all of this, and that would probably be the the essential way to go about it, right? Of let other people mess around with this, let them leverage their expertise. Whereas I'm 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 interested and I want to learn how to do it. Yeah, yeah. I so so it sounds like you just told me again that this stuff really matters to you. The yep. stuff that's yep. not the traditional what you would normally think was the essential path. But I want to actually use different language because okay. that because but that's you would say that's not the efficient path because in pure efficiency you'd say well no you can just outsource this outsource that somebody else can do it it doesn't have to be me so that's the end of it whereas as I listen to you talk it's completely obvious to me that this is the essential path for you it's, it's not it's not even to me there's no query about that. It's what you're pulled to. It's what you're drawn to. It's what you've understood and experienced is working. So all of those reasons say, no, trust this, lean into it, double down on it. Now, the question I asked was whether this was something you were underinvesting in. And so and that is actually a question back to you. Is it, do you feel, no, I'm investing the sufficient level. I feel good about it. Or do you wish, I wish I did spend extra X amount of hours per week on this because I just feel there's more here. Your thoughts? I, I th it's difficult to answer without hindsight, right? Right now, in the moment, I feel like I'm putting enough time to this. I'll, and I'll give you an example. Last Friday, as we record this, um, the beginning of the week, right, I did our first live stream that we've done in ages. We've got tons and tons of questions. And so we're going to launch a new show. I don't know what it's going to be called. You ask Will or Sales Answered or something like that. And all weekend, I spent a ton of time Again, I could I could pay some, the, the team would do this for me. The team would advise us. Uh, we've got a specialist in the team that could help. But I really enjoyed learning about um, live video production. So rather than just doing a two one camera Q and A session, I really want to spruce it up and see what value can we add. And and to your kind of uh, expertise and what you think is essential, the graphics, the animation, the um, the metaphors via slides that we can add onto on top of it, doing a bit of preparation on the questions rather than just kind of throwing it out there. I really enjoy doing that. So uh, it's a bit of a cop out. I don't know whether this is whether this is a good use of my. I don't know whether this is uh, to answer your question going to be effective until after I've done it. But thus far, my gut feeling on all of this is that it is useful. It separates us from all the competition. Anyone can start a podcast. It's very difficult to get a podcast with the polish that we have. And I, I treat it like a moat, right, around the castle, business-wise. The more and more um, water that goes down the moat, the deeper it gets. It's more and more difficult for someone to catch up. And so from a business perspective, it's valuable there. And I enjoy doing it from from that perspective as well. So I'm not sure if I answered your question again, Greg. I might have just yeah, spun no, you there I, a little bit. I, I, think, I think you did not <laughs> answer the question, but I but well, you did but in a certain way. I mean, what you're saying is that you feel really good about the direction you're going in. That's yeah. what you just said to me. sure. And and I think I think that's uh, I, I think you know you can tell that you 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 spark up your energy is high talking about this. You know you 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 are all in with it. And I think these are all um, things that are hard uh, to pretend about. Uh, when, when when I'm talking to people, you know, it's I'm I'm always interested in where is the energy, uh, where where does the um, you know what 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 are people being pulled towards? Because what you want in life is to be operating at your highest point of contribution, uh, and not simply be doing a ton of things because that's what everyone else is doing, and you're copying them, and so you're just you're just in the, in the mode of, of of sort of you know doing doing everything that. That you're keeping up with the Joneses type yeah. type way of, of making decisions. You you want less but better, but better means the stuff you feel passionate about, driven towards. Your talent is being you know connected to. It sounds like that's what you feel this direction is for you. Yeah, you you might have other judgments on that. Uh, interviewing me here and on my abilities and all of this, but yeah, I, I do feel like um, I feel like 
for me, so I'm selling product or service, right? I could be cold calling. I could be emailing. I could be uh, going, not necessarily at the moment, but I could be going to conferences. We did a space of conferences a couple of years ago. And I've not been to a conference since because I didn't enjoy it. It wasn't the fact that we weren't doing uh, generating leads. I just didn't enjoy speaking to random people and having to like BS my way into conversations when I know <laughs> that I can produce this show, right? And this show will get 30, 40,000 downloads on the audio side of things. We've had episodes on YouTube that have taken off. Uh, one with Chris Voss that's got like half a million views, a bunch that have got hundreds of thousands. Some of them have got like a couple of hundred. So I know that this... It, it, because I, I, I guess this is kind of, and we'll wrap up with this, Greg. I guess is where we go with this. I'm aligning what I, what I enjoy, with the sales process, and thankfully it works. If it didn't work, I'd be knackered, and I'd have to probably take a different approach, right? But I think it works because it's congruent with what I want from the business. It's congruent because I enjoy having these conversations with you and have yourself uh, flip the tables and have just an interesting conversation, and the audience buys into that as well. They enjoy listening to it, and so it's it it's, it works for everyone. And so that is that bit of purpose that I could throw out into the world of uh, rather than just talking about how to start a cold call, which nobody really really gives, gives a, a, an ass about, right? <laughs> I can have these more in-depth conversations and hopefully for the audience, there's that little bit of spin-off. And that's why I kind of tried to pull it out of sales kind of midway through the conversation of th th these conversations add that extra layer of value. And hopefully people go, oh, he's, he's not a complete idiot. Uh, maybe we'll buy from him in the future. So I, I think uh, that it all kind of aligns up with I'm still selling, but I'm doing it in a way that is congruent and effective with uh, kind of how I see the world and, and how I want to be showing up in it. Yeah, that, that's that's such a, a good way of connecting the dots on that, and and I think that for for me too. So so one of the reasons I, you know, not just wrote essentialism, but then after you know seven years of uh, of, of teaching on essentialism, just felt like it's time to to put out a, another book, and the book is effortless. That's the name of it. One of the principles in that, one of the chapters, is is about how can I make this enjoyable. There's a presumption. That essential things have to be hard and trivial things will be easy. And that is a mindset. And sometimes that's true. But what if it doesn't have to be? And your example is, is now one more anecdote, one more case study of how the essential can also be made more enjoyable. You don't just have to say, well, sales is cold calls. So are you willing to do it <laughs> like a 1980s motivational yeah. speaker. Are you just going to willing to do the hard stuff? Get out and do it. Well, you can do that. That's one idea. Or you can find an easier, funner, more enjoyable, more aligned to your talents, your interests, way of being successful. That's exactly what you're saying you're doing and you feel it. You, you didn't like the conferences. How often do people, well, yeah, but you got to do it. You don't like it, but you got to do it. You got to eat your greens. You know, so just or you find a different path, a better path, an easier path. It's still essential, but it's more enjoyable. I mean, that is exactly, you've just made the case for, uh, for the whole, you know, for one of the main ideas in, in, in effortless sales and effortless living. Amazing stuff. Well, uh, tell us more about the book. And then for everyone who's just enjoyed you flipping, uh, turning the tables there, Greg, tell us about the show. And everyone's listening on their iPhones right now. They, uh, tell us where they can find it so we can subscribe as well. Yeah, so the it's the What's Essential uh, podcast. You can find it, you know, anywhere where if you're, you're listening to podcast, you can you can just search for it. Uh, What's Essential with Greg McEwen. Um, you know, we just we just have uh, you know people on at the very top of their game. We just had Matthew McConaughey. Uh, just uh, just interviewed him on Friday. Uh, very interesting conversation. We you know we went beyond. You know, he has a new book out, and it, it was, we talked about that in the stories. But we ended up having a, a, a real live coaching session, in which well, I, won't, I won't spoil it now. But it's uh, it was absolutely fascinating to watch, um, to see what he's grappling with and how he is trying to get to the next level in his life and in his career. And, and he went beyond wherever I think he's ever gone before in his thinking. Uh, so these we do these very live essential interventions. Uh, and, and it makes for, you know, it's not canned, it's, it, it's for real. So that's the podcast, What's the Central Podcast. Um, there's, uh, for people who are interested in, in, in effortless uh, or essentialism, uh, if, they, if, you, if you order either of those books, you can go to essentialism.com. Either one, you'll get access to a 21-day essentialism challenge, which helps you to try and make it easier to try and implement some of these 
uh, changes in your life so that you can focus on what's essential, but also so you can make it more achievable, doable, enjoyable, uh, easier, eventually effortless. Amazing stuff. Well, I'll link to both the books and the podcast in the show notes over at salesman.org so we can find it nice and, and easily there. I'll link to some of the other books and content that we talked about in this episode as well. And with that, Greg, I really thank you for your time. I am a massive fan of the books, so I will give you my uh, give give my uh, kind of uh, kind of seal of approval for what it's worth on, on the show as well for everyone who's listening. And with that, Greg, I really thank you for joining us on the show today. Well, it's been fantastic. Thank you.